The US Air Force is scrapping the Boeing E-7 Wedgetail program, the very aircraft once hailed as the Air Force's next great sentinel of the skies. Sleek, jet-powered, equipped with one of the most advanced radars ever put on an airplane. Instead, the Air Force is pivoting to the Navy's E-2D Advanced Hawkeye, a smaller, slower, twin turboprop that traces its design lineage all the way back to the 1960s. At first glance, it looks like a downgrade, a step back into the past. But as always in military aviation, appearances can be deceiving. It isn't just a procurement hiccup. It's a story about how America is rethinking the very future of airborne warfare, about survivability, flexibility, and the hard choices it makes to command the skies in an era of stealth fighters, hypersonic missiles, and contested airspace. This is a story of shifting priorities, billion-dollar risks, and one of the boldest gambles in US Air Force history. To understand why this moment matters, we need to rewind. For more than four decades, the Boeing E-3 Sentry was the gold standard of airborne early warning and control. Instantly recognizable by its flying saucer-like rotor dome perched on a modified Boeing 707, the Sentry wasn't just a radar plane. It was an airborne nerve center. At its heart was the ANAPY-12 radar, capable of detecting aircraft more than 250 miles away, even at low altitudes. It could track up to 600 targets simultaneously, while directing as many as 40 intercepts at once. Inside, a crew of nearly two dozen airmen sat at consoles, managing the situation, vectoring fighters, and feeding commanders real-time intelligence. The Sentry's battlefield impact was nothing short of legendary. During Operation Desert Storm in 1991, E-3 crews essentially choreographed the air war, ensuring coalition pilots always had the first look and the first shot. Later, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and more recently in NATO patrols over Eastern Europe, the Sentry provided the invisible edge, warning of Russian sorties before they even reached the border. But even legends age. The youngest E-3 in service today is more than 40 years old. Its TF-33 engines are gas guzzlers, spares are scarce, and the avionics are trapped in the analog era. Maintenance costs have exploded. The Sentry's watch is ending, and everyone knows it. The replacement seemed obvious. Enter the Boeing E-7 Wedgetail, built on the modern 737-700 platform. Instead of a clunky rotor dome, it carried the multi-role electronically scanned array or MESA radar. And here is where the Wedgetail dazzled. Unlike the old spinning dishes, Mesa was electronically scanned, capable of staring in multiple directions at once. If the E-3 was like sweeping a flashlight across a dark room, the E-7 was like flicking on stadium lights. Its radar had a detection range of nearly 370 kilometers, able to track 180 targets at refresh rates fast enough to monitor stealth fighters, cruise missiles, and maritime traffic simultaneously. Performance-wise, the Wedgetail was every inch the 21st century Sentinel. Cruising at Mach 0.78 with a range of more than 6,000 kilometers and the ability to stay aloft 12 hours with refueling, it carried a leaner crew of 10 to 12 operators who benefited from digital consoles and modern comms suites. It wasn't just theory either. Australia's wedgetails earned their stripes over Iraq and Syria, managing hundreds of coalition strike sorties without a single comms breakdown. South Korea, Turkey and the UK bought in. By 2022, the US Air Force was on board, committing billions to acquire at least 26 of them. The wedgetail wasn't just a replacement, it was supposed to be the future. Yet, as the US Air Force embarked on its own wedge-tail acquisition, 
cracks began to show. The first was cost. What started as a $588 million per aircraft promise ballooned to $724 million as delays mounted and development hurdles multiplied. Congressional oversight, auditors, and Pentagon planners all raised alarms. For two prototype aircraft, costs had jumped by nearly 33% and the timeline for delivery slipped even farther into the future, with actual operational service now pushed back years. But cost was just the tip of the iceberg. The fundamental issue was survivability. And in the Pentagon's view, a dedicated airborne warning and control aircraft, even one as advanced as the wedge tail, is simply too vulnerable in a peer conflict against adversaries like China or Russia. Sophisticated long-range missiles, relentless electronic warfare, and advanced stealth aircraft have made the skies more dangerous than ever. A wedge tail, flying in contested airspace, can be picked off before it even gets a chance to do its job. That led senior military officials to question the logic of investing billions into a fleet that could be a target rather than a shield. Instead, the Trump administration and Air Force leadership began pivoting hard towards space-based solutions global radar satellites that could track targets anywhere on Earth, with none of the risk airborne planes face. At the same time, the Pentagon proposed an awkward stopgap, supplement the old E-3 Sentry fleet with the Navy's E-2 Hawkeye, a smaller, less capable airborne warning system. Critics pointed out this was a downgrade, not a modernization and would leave a gap in continental air defense and battle management. The abrupt change wasn't universally embraced. Congressional committees pushed back, adding amendments to bar the Department of Defense from ending wedge-tail production. Defense experts lamented the loss, claiming space-based solutions are still years away and unable to loiter over critical zones for extended periods, and that the E-7's unique capabilities were being sacrificed for broad, untested promises. At heart, the wedge tail's failure in the U.S. is emblematic of a bigger debate about the future of air power. Should resources go to highly capable but increasingly vulnerable airborne platforms? Or should the military commit to ambitious, satellite-based networks that promise global reach but may not deliver for years? In this scramble, the wedge tail was caught in the crossfire. Its platform was perfectly great, as military officials admitted, but not survivable enough, nor flexible enough to meet the growing demands of worldwide sensing and distributed battle management. So, the US Air Force cancelled its wedge tail by, left its E-3 sentries to soldier on, and bet the farm on sensors in space. Whether the gamble pays off, and bet the farm on sensors in space. Whether that gamble pays off is yet to be seen. What's certain is that the wedge tail's story is a cautionary tale for any military struggling to modernize in an age where the stakes and the targets keep moving. But with the wedge tail program canceled, military planners faced an uncomfortable reality. Modernization isn't always about chasing bigger, flashier platforms. Instead, the Hawkeye, a seemingly modest twin turboprop with a lineage stretching back to the Kennedy administration, stood ready, proven, and adaptable. But as the Air Force and Navy began relying more heavily on this vulnerable aircraft, the question loomed. Could a smaller, carrier-based plane actually deliver the high-tech detection and battle management needed in today's high-threat airspace? Or was this simply the best of limited options in an era where survival now means distribution, not dominance? The Hawkeye doesn't look like much. Twin turboprops, a crew of just five, a design lineage stretching back to the Kennedy administration. 
But the E2D is one of those deceptively simple machines that consistently punches above its weight. Its ANAPY-9 radar is a hybrid marvel, combining mechanical scanning with AESA-like electronic agility. The result? A 360-degree coverage bubble with a detection range of more than 550 kilometers against large targets. Crucially, it can spot low observable aircraft, stealth fighters, cruise missiles and drones, even when they're hugging the terrain or sea surface. Performance-wise, the E-2D isn't about speed or altitude. It cruises modestly at 300 knots with an endurance of around 6 hours and a ceiling just over 34,000 feet. But what it lacks in flash, it makes up for in versatility. It can fly from short runways and austere forward bases. Its smaller footprint means you can disperse them across multiple locations, which is exactly the doctrine the Pentagon is now embracing. Survival through distribution. Perhaps most importantly, the Hawkeye is already in production. It's mature. It works. Navy crews fly it daily from carrier decks. In recent trials, Hawkeye's guided SM-6 interceptors to successful shots against supersonic targets, essentially acting as the airborne quarterback for integrated missile defense. In Red Flag and Pacific Fleet exercises, they've proven their ability to spot stealth aggressor aircraft before ground radars ever lit them up. Suddenly, this humble turboprop didn't look so modest after all. The Air Force's embrace of the E-2D signals more than a platform swap. It reflects a deeper doctrinal shift. For decades, American air power relied on a handful of large, high-value airborne command posts. AWACS, J-STARS, rivet joints, orbiting safely at the edge of battle. That model worked when adversaries lacked the means to strike back. But the modern battlefield is different. From the Western Pacific to Eastern Europe, big, slow targets are vulnerable. Hypersonic missiles slash reaction times to seconds. Long-range SAMs extend no-go zones hundreds of miles from enemy shores. Survivability has become as important as raw radar power. By leaning into the Hawkeye, the Air Force is betting on smaller, more numerous, more survivable nodes, aircraft, drones and satellites all knitted together by resilient networks like Link 16 and the emerging cooperative engagement capability. Better a swarm of small eyes than one giant, fragile brain. Of course, this gamble comes with trade-offs. The wedge tail could stay aloft nearly twice as long as Hawkeye and carried twice the crew. Its radar more powerful in raw numbers, could monitor greater volumes of sky. And the wedge tail was boom fuel compatible. A big deal for the Air Force, whereas the Hawkeye uses the Navy's probe and drogue system, creating logistical headaches. No one pretends the E-2D is a one-for-one -one replacement for the sentry or wedge tail. It can't match their command post role. But it can fly now survive in tomorrow's contested skies, and buy time until more futuristic solutions arrive. From an engineering perspective, the contrast is fascinating. The Wedgetail's MESA radar is like a supercomputer, dazzling in capability, but demanding in terms of power, cooling, and integration. The Hawkeye's ANAPY-9 is more like a ruggedized field laptop, not as glamorous, but brutally efficient, optimized for resilience under pressure. This is the essence of engineering tradecraft in warfare. Sometimes the question isn't what's the most advanced, but rather what works reliably under fire. So what comes next? The Air Force isn't placing all its chips on the Hawkeye. Long term, the vision is distributed. Satellites in low Earth orbit providing persistent watch. 
high-altitude stealth drones like the rumoured RQ-180 carrying radar payloads. Manned aircraft sharing command and control roles across multiple platforms instead of a single airborne hub. Programs like the Advanced Battle Management System, or ABMS, are working to knit this web together, creating a resilient combat cloud where no single aircraft is irreplaceable. In that vision, the E2D isn't the end game. It's a bridge, a stopgap sentinel that holds the line while the next generation matures. And history suggests this is nothing new. In the 1950s, the Air Force built massive B-36 bombers, only to abandon them almost overnight once intercontinental missiles changed the game. In the 1970s, critics said aircraft carriers were obsolete, yet the Navy adapted and carriers remain central to American power projection today. The pivot from Wedgetail to Hawkeye fits the same pattern, adaptation under pressure Sacrifice of elegance for survivability, speed, and pragmatism. So, here's the bottom line. The US Air Force isn't just swapping one aircraft for another. It's rewriting its doctrine for controlling the skies. The wedge tail may still find a role, but for now, it's the unassuming Hawkeye. A design rooted in the 1960s that is stepping into one of the most critical jobs in modern warfare. It's a reminder that in the age of stealth and hypersonics, sometimes what matters most isn't raw power, but the ability to endure, adapt, and fight another day. The question is whether this gamble pays off, or whether, a decade from now, the Air Force finds itself scrambling yet again for the sentinel of the skies. Because one thing hasn't changed since the days of Desert Storm. Whoever controls the sky's information controls the battle below. This wraps up our look at the Air Force's bold shift from the high-tech Wedgetail to the battle-tested Hawkeye, a move that could reshape the future of airborne command and control. But what do you think? Is the E-2D the right choice for tomorrow's contested skies, or should the Air Force have stayed the course with the Wedgetail? Would you like us to dive deeper into other command center aircraft like the E-4B Doomsday Plane, the E-6B Mercury, or even unique test beds like the mysterious Rat 55? Let us know in the comments. And as always, don't forget to hit subscribe and ring the bell to stay updated with our latest episodes. While you're here, check out one of our other deep dives into the world of cutting-edge military aviation. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.